Okay, welcome back to uh, CS162, everybody. Um, we are going to uh, pick up where we left off on uh, Tuesday and uh, tell you a little bit about some queuing theory and, uh, and then pile into some interesting things about file systems. Um, first, however, I want to uh, remind you what we talked about last time. We were talking about spinning storage um, and the fact that uh, inside a disk drive, there are a series of platters, as I show in this diagram. There is a uh, head which can move in and out uh, to talk to different tracks. These platters have two sides to them, and there are heads on each side. All of the a track is a circular path on one surface, and all of the tracks that are on top of each other are called a cylinder. Uh, there's three-stage process to reading or writing data. The first is basically the seek time, which is the time it takes to move the head into the right cylinder. And then uh, there's rotational latency, which is you wait um, until the, the um, particular sector that you're interested in rotates under the head. And then the transfer time, which is the time to actually get the bits. And notice that typically the rotational latency is half of a rotation on average. That's a probabilistic statement. And so when we then take into account queuing uh, and controller time, which we haven't talked about queuing at all yet, uh, then the disk latency for an access is a combination of uh, the queuing time plus the controller time plus seek time, rotation time, and transfer time. All right. Uh, there was, is there a um, question here we have is, is there an average time for the seek time as well? So um, yes. And uh, typically, the seek time is uh, stated on the specs of the disk, uh, might be, for instance, uh, four milliseconds. And uh, as I briefly mentioned last time, if you have a good file system that can keep locality, then it's going to be attempting to uh, move a lot less. And so that seek time that's spec is actually uh, the time on average to go from any track to any other track. That's an n squared computation. Um, but on average, you're going to get something more like 25% or 33% of that uh, spec seek time. So that's a good, good question. So disks only rotate in one direction, yes. And they, uh, it takes a lot of time to start and stop them because they're mechanical things. So typically, you'd only stop them when you think you're going to be idle for a long time. And then one more question was, why don't we have one head for each platter? I mentioned that last time. Um, the answer is that it's just expensive because the, the uh, the um, piezoelectric movement of the head and the heads themselves are all very complicated and expensive. And so um, since disks are a commodity part, you basically only have uh, kind of one uh, conglomerate head that moves together. Oh, and by the way, we do, um, maybe I misunderstood that question. There is one head on either side of each platter, but they're all tied together and they move as a whole. So maybe that was uh, uh, the question that was actually being asked. Um, all right. Now, last time there was some interest in what exactly flash memory was. I thought I would say a tiny bit more about that since uh, that was brought up. And uh, any of you who have actually taken a class that has CMOS transistors in it, uh, you know, like 141 or something like that, will recognize this diagram where we have silicon, uh, there's a uh, doped source and drain, and typically on a transistor, there's one gate. And if we uh, raise the voltage on that gate, there's a single word line then, um, current will flow. And if we lower the voltage, then current won't. And so this becomes a switch. What we do that's different for flash memory is we put two gates with a, an insulator in between. And so you can't actually cause uh, flow between this uh, under normal circumstances. And so what we do is uh, when we want to program this thing, we raise the word line to a really high voltage, which uh, basically forces uh, electrons to go across that um, oxide layer and get trapped on the floating gate. And the, res the result of those, um, of those uh, electrons being trapped there is just like uh, a movement on the word line. And so then that will actually, even though we remove all the vo uh, voltage on the word line, we can either have uh, current or not, depending on whether there are uh, trends there, um, whether or not there are electrons that are trapped there. All right. And so that's basically how flash works. And the, the erase uh, process is basically uh, raising the word line uh, and far enough that uh, the transistors are then attracted off and you get rid of all the trapped, uh, um, excuse me, I meant electrons get pulled off of that. So um, that's called a floating gate. Um, there's two varieties of flash memory, NAND, which is much denser, and NOR, which 
uh, is uh, more sync fast, but not really used very much these days. And there's even 3D stacking of these. And so a lot of modern uh, flash chips have many layers of transistors on top of each other. All right. So the basic uh, idea here is trapping electrons on the floating gate, and that will distinguish between a one and a zero. Uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out here is this is the NAND structure. So those of you that know something about transistors might recognize this. But what happens is we have one page, which is 4K uh, bytes, is a whole group of these bits with the floating gates. And the pages are built up into blocks. And these blocks are a little different from what we talk about on a disk drive. These blocks are multiple pages. And the key thing that I said last time is basically that uh, you have to erase a whole block at a time. That might be 256 kilobytes. And then you can selectively write some bits on a page. And then you end up using that page. The problem is that you can't um, write over a page that you've already written on. So you have to erase a whole block first, and then uh, you can um, start writing on the pages. And so that makes the management of this flash memory more complicated because the controller for the flash has to keep track of which blocks have been erased, and then it can hand out empty pages. Um, and then uh, it's got to every now and then uh, basically group pages together that are uh, still have valid data on them and then erase big blocks so that there can be a free list. And so there is some communication between the file system and the flash as to which pages that still have ones and zeros on them are actually not in use anymore so they can get collected together to be erased. All right. Uh, and so you could actually say that in flash memory, uh, copy on write is the normal behavior because if you write a block and then you want to write it again, you end up having to copy it uh, somewhere else and write the bits you wanted to change. Okay, so um, the summary that we had for SSDs was really the pros against disk drives. It's low latency and high throughput because there isn't any seek or rotational delays. There's no moving parts and so it's more reliable, it's lightweight, it's low power, um, very shock uh, insensitive, which is also good. And you can read at memory speeds. Write is more complicated, as I mentioned, because there is this process both of having to raise the voltage uh, high enough to uh, attract um, or force electrons across that insulator barrier, but also you have to erase every now and then and uh, keep free list uh, of erased blocks. And so the writing is a little more uh, time consuming. Um, the cons, again, are there um, that SSD storage is typically smaller than a disk and a little more expensive, but that keeps improving. Um, and wear out happens. If you write uh, over a transistor too many times, it'll stop working. And I, I can actually show you why that is. This, uh, the process of writing is basically forcing electrons into sitting on this floating gate. The problem is that when you do that forcing, some of them get lodged actually in the insulator. And over time, uh, the fact that there are those electrons that are stuck there and can't be removed kind of removes the uh, effectiveness of the gate. And so after a while, the flash memory wears out. OK. Um, and then also, uh, is there any consideration toward optimizing SSD access properties is a question, minimizing writes in any kind of software? Yeah, so people uh, do all sorts of things to optimize for writes. I mean, the simplest thing that happens is the, the uh, SSD itself, the controller, um, basically does what's called wear leveling. And it makes sure that all of the blocks uh, and all of the um, individual transistors are written in a uh, regular fashion to try to spread all the writes out to try to um, you know not wear out any particular bits um, but then there's also some software that uh, tries to minimize writes and um, we can talk about that a little offline if you like and I may mention a little bit about that when we talk about flash file systems so the final thing I wanted to mention here is that the uh, the cost profile of SSDs versus H uh, HDDs uh, hard disk drives has been changing pretty drastically and uh, getting better. And so, um, you know, now in the 500 gigabyte range, it's pretty easy to find a uh, low cost equivalents of uh, flash that are very replaceable for hard disk drives. And it's only in the really big ones that it's still pretty expensive, but this profile keeps changing. And so they get cheaper and cheaper over time. And, uh, you know, I haven't, as I mentioned last time, I haven't bought a laptop with uh, spinning storage on it in years because the advantages of the SSD far outweigh uh, the uh, slight 
cost and increase and slight small uh, smallness of them. Okay. So then now to move on to our new topic. So we were talking about IO performance where the uh, response time here is something to do with the queue, which we haven't talked about, plus IO device service time, which it can be controller and something about the IO device, which varies on the type of device. Uh, in the performance of an IO subsystem, there's lots of metrics you might have, like you could talk about what's the response time for an access, or what's the throughput in number of transactions per second. Uh, the effective bandwidth per operation, which is sort of a transfer size over response time. Um, and so that would be the total transfer size of n bytes divided by, well, there's some overhead typically, and then some bandwidth to write. And so the trick is if this overhead is too high, then your effective bandwidth is very low unless n is large. Okay, and so this s, which is the overhead, becomes very expensive with disk drives because as you might uh, remember from a moment ago here, we have to seek and then we have to rotate and then eventually we can read and write at full bandwidth. And so um, it's very important for us to optimize file systems to try to not seek, uh, to seek as little as possible. The other thing here, if you notice, is the typical queuing response time has this curve to it, whereas we get closer to 100% or 100% utilization, uh, our response time goes through the roof. And this, surprisingly, is a, an, um, an artifact of the queue itself and the probabilistic entrance of data into the queue. And so this queuing behavior actually can be far more uh, costly in terms of performance than any of the controller and IO de device service times. So contributing factors to latency, as we mentioned, are all the software paths that uh, come through the operating system and queuing and so on, which you can loosely model as a queue. There's the hardware controller itself and then the IO device service time. And so one of the advantages of switching to an SSD over a disk is of course you don't have that seek or uh, rotational delay and so you have a much faster overall performance regardless of how spread out the data is and that can be um, very important. But what about this queuing behavior? Well, it can lead to really big increases in latency as you get your utilization closest to 100%. And um, I've mentioned this before in the class and I'm gonna say it again. I have my utilization uh, horse here that I would climb onto is to, is to say never run anything at 100%. So you as engineers out there should uh, keep that in mind. You're welcome to quote me on that because anytime you get to close to 100% of the uh, weight bearing capacity of a bridge or the utilization of a disk drive or whatever, there are always bad effects and queuing is just one of them. Um, you can get cascading failures in a bridge as you get close to 100%. And so um, really what we would like is, I haven't explained this behavior yet, but if you, ha if you knew you had this behavior, you clearly want to be in this lower part of the utilization curve where you're in the roughly linear region rather than in this exponential growth region here, which is uh, when things are getting really bad in terms of latency. Uh, just a little bit of an increase in utilization and suddenly your uh, response time uh, increases quite drastically. So remember, Kubi says never run anything at 100%. You guys can quote me on that. All right. um, so let's look at trying to figure out where does this come from? Um, so if we were in a deterministic world, which of course we're not, uh, life would be much simpler. Okay, so we'd have arrivals would come into a queue and they would be uh, arriving on a regular uh, interval. We're gonna call that T sub A. So every T sub A, some uh, item arrives. That's like a request to read something off the disk, for instance, every T sub A. It's deterministic, so these T sub A's are all equal. And then it sits in the queue for a little while and then it comes out of the queue and uh, this is the time in the queue and then it gets serviced in the server, we're also gonna assume is deterministic. And so the amount of time is always TS. And uh, in this deterministic world, what we see here is something pretty interesting, which is you know, the item goes into the queue, it waits there just a little bit, it's immediately taken out, it goes into the server for TS time. And we can exactly predict what's gonna happen here because we know that from the moment we uh, put the, from the moment the item arrives, so when it's done is really just TQ plus TS and it's always the same, okay? So um, this particular world uh, is easy to analyze. 
Um, for instance, we can start talking about mu, which is a variable you'll see more of in a moment, which is the service rate. How fast can we serve things at this server? And it's really one over T sub S. So that's the number of operations per second we can serve, and that's just one over the time to serve. Okay, and so the maximum that this server could do is, uh, you know, an item every one over TS, or what that really means is if we uh, fill up TA with TSs, um, at that point we're 100% utilized. Okay. The arrival rate, which is how fast things are coming over, is one over TA. So notice that's how fast are these things arriving per unit time, and it's really one over the period, okay? And that's often lambda. So lambda and mu are very common uh, variables that you should be uh, quite familiar with, okay? And uh, again, lambda is the arrival rate, mu is the service rate. And this utilization, which is lambda over mu, is an important quantity. So if lambda, is less than mu, so the rate at which things arrive are less than the rate at which we can service them, then we're good to go, all right? If it's, uh, if we're uh, in a situation where lamb things are arriving faster than we can service them, then we're in trouble. Now there's a question about why, uh, why are we not talking about one over T sub S plus T sub Q? Um, and the answer is that the Q is an independent item from the server, so we can pipeline through the queue into the server. So the, the bottleneck in this scenario is T sub S, not TQ plus T sub S. T, uh, TQ plus T sub S is really from a person who's watching an arrival going through the system and departing, they're gonna see that it takes that amount of time to get serviced to them. But in terms of the throughput of the system, we really only care about uh, T sub S. Hopefully that answered that question. So, um, now, the average rate is the complete story in this, and uh, it's an easy thing to analyze. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that uh, the world is very rarely deterministic. But let's continue with this for a moment. So the offered load is really that um, TS over TA is the offered load here. And um, if you look at uh, this amount that we put in here, as we uh, go from a utilization of zero to a utilization of one, we can certainly handle this because we're not overloading the server. And the time that things are stuck in the queue is constant and it's small. So if you notice this, uh, as long as this service time is smaller than my arrival time, I'm okay. Uh, and basically the, um, you know, I'm always just going through the queue and it's also always constant because um, that is purely, I'm gonna assume here for a moment that the reason that TQ is not zero is there's some pointer manipulation or something there for getting in and out of the queue, but it's really small, okay? So um, once, however, we start getting to where we have more things arriving than uh, we can serve, so in other words, the arrival rate is too fast, then we're over in this region where utilization is greater than one. And at that point, what happens is the throughput we get out of the system keeps growing until it's at equal to one. Uh, and then at that point, we can't get a throughput more than one. So we can't get more than um, sort of that server 100% busy. Because if we try, um, well, nothing's gonna happen, right? If this server here, is 100% busy, we can't shove more items through that than 100% uh, busy. And so at that point, um, our throughput basically is, is saturated and we can add, we can have many more things that uh, arrive, but what's gonna happen there? The queue is going to uh, grow, right? So the time we wait in the queue is just gonna keep growing here. And uh, in fact, we are, um, you know, we could end up waiting an arbitrarily long time if there's too many things arriving. Okay. In this ideal linear world we've been talking about, it's still very easy to analyze what's going on. You can see the saturation. You can kind of see that the time it takes for you to get serviced keeps growing. And when you're in this uh, region here, but um, it's growing, the queue's growing without bounds. So basically what's happening is we're still serving at a given rate. That's why we're saturating here, but the queue just keeps growing. And so this queue is going to grow without bound, um, but it's pretty easy to, to evaluate. Um, and what you can see here, though, of course, is utilization equal to one. 
is our key point here. If we're above utilization equal to one, we're unbounded. If we're below it, uh, we're serving properly. Now, let's change this up a little bit to something more realistic. So now the arrivals are gonna be bursty. So they don't arrive at exactly the same rate. They're gonna arrive at some rate having to do with the software that's running and the number of processes that are running and it's gonna be basically bursty. They're gonna kind of arrive really quickly and then there might be some idle time, and another uh, quick burst. And so what happens here is the following. So the first one arrives and then we start serving. Excuse me, okay? And if you look, um, what happens when the next one arrives, okay? Well, the next one here shows up, but notice how it's showing up before the first one's done being served. Okay, and by the way, I, I took this service time and I added it to the queue time, and this total here you can see is the time uh, that we're going to be um, seeing from the standpoint of somebody who's putting a, a request in and getting it out. But so we're busy serving here, but the next one arrives before the service is done, and now it's got to sit in the queue. And it's got to sit in the queue uh, until the server's done, right? And then if another one arrives also in that time, now we've got two items that are queued and one that's being served. So now we're in a situation where the number of items actually in the queue is growing rather than being essentially zero, which is what it was before. And what by the time, um, this guy uh, finishes, oh wait, excuse me, I, I, um, let, me, let me backtrack. This white one is actually another one that arrived here, okay? So at the point, we've actually got three items in here, white, orange, blue, thank you. Sorry, um, sorry for uh, screwing that up. And if you notice, what happens now is by the time the blue one's done, then the white one gets to run, and now the one that's at the head of the queue is orange, and the head of the, the next one is blue. And then uh, when the white one finishes, the orange one gets to run, and now the only thing in the queue is, is the powder blue. And then finally we get to run, and we're done, and maybe we pick up from that point. So if you notice what happened is things bunched up. We had a blue one arrive, then a white one, then an orange one, then a blue, uh, powder blue one. And three of them are sitting in the queue, so the queue's building up, and then it, uh, then it um, sort of the queue decreases and drains as no more items come. And um, what you can see here is that burstiness leads to the queue growing, even if the average is such that um, our average utilization is not over one. But we still have these bursty periods where the queue grows and then it drains out. Okay, so this situation I've shown here is the same average arrival time, but almost all the requests experience very large queue delays. So look at this look at the white one arrived here but it's not finished till there. So that's a, a much larger queuing delay than this blue one. And the orange one arrived here and notice when it's done. Okay, so it's queuing delay is, is huge. And then this powder blue one arrived here and look, look at how long it waited. So even though the average arrival rate is the same and we've got a utilization that's less than one, we're still building up queuing delay because of the burstiness. Okay, I'm gonna pause on that. All right, so this is a situation where the average uh, arrival rate is uh, still low enough that our utilization's less than one, but because things have burstiness on the input, our queue builds up and our average response time gets long. Okay, are there any questions on that? Now, just to back up here for a moment, I wanna show you this curve. See this curve? This is a queuing delay curve. And what you see is as the throughput um, gets closer to utilization and we've got randomness, that's what this curve's about, we grow, um, our response time keeps getting bigger as we get closer to, to uh, full utilization. And you can understand that in this graph here by uh, if we're, if things are arriving at a rate that is very close to 100% utilization, then um, these, this server is going to be almost totally full by the time we get the next burst of arrivals. And so it's going to take a very long time, for instance, from this arrival of this blue one to its service time. And so we're starting to get that part of the curve uh, that is growing rapidly. Okay. All right.
Now, so how do we model bursting? So I, are there any questions on this? I, I think this is what's fun about this simple animation here is I think it shows you how just a little burstiness can lead to very long service times. Uh, and it's a little counterintuitive the first time you see it. Um, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody kind of caught that, all right? Now, um, how do we model that burstiness, all right? Well, there is one option, which is if we don't have any information about what's, the, what's this arrival uh, rate look like, then one thing that we can do is use something that's called a memoryless distribution, which is exponential. Okay, and it looks kind of like this, and it says that the likelihood of uh, the arrival of an event, you know, what's the distance between the arrival of one event and the next, looks like this exponential curve. It's uh, lambda e to the minus lambda x is this curve, okay? And um, the mean arrival interval is one over lambda, okay? And this is called the, the memoryless or Poisson distribution, okay, or exponential distribution. And there's a lot of short arrival times, that's because it's bursty, but then there's this long tail where there's, a, there's a, occasionally uh, a very long interval um, for arrivals, okay? And this mean arrival interval is the average arrival rate, and that's the thing that we divide by the service time uh, and hope that we've got a, um, got a utilization less than one, okay? Now, uh, let's think about what memoryless distributions really are. So first and foremost, they are uh, what you model when you don't have quite enough information. Uh, the good thing about a memoryless arrival is essentially that uh, if you have a bunch of independent things that are all uh, generating events and you feed them together into uh, a common queue, then what happens is you get something that somewhat converges toward a memoryless distribution, uh, even though the individual ones weren't memoryless. And so this is kind of the default approximation people have when they don't have any other information. They say, well, I know on average thing or, things are arriving at some rate, and so then I'll come up with uh, something so that that average is equal to one over lambda, and they call it memoryless. Now, uh, why do we call this memoryless? Well, this is exactly like sort of waiting for a bus in Berkeley, right? So, the thing about this uh, arrival rate here is that uh, if you've been waiting for an hour, you might think with a regular probability distribution of arrival times that um, that out, the fact that you've been waiting for an hour might tell you something about how long until the next bus arrives because you say, well, it's gonna arrive soon because I've been waiting so long. The key thing about memoryless is if you say I've been waiting for two units of time like I've got here and I rescale the, the remaining part of this curve with the knowledge that it's already been waited two, we already waited two units of time, what you'll find is the curve is exactly the same shape. So how long you've waited tells you absolutely nothing about how long you're going to wait. So memoryless, just like buses at Berkeley. Right? <laughs> um, now, uh, let's, um, before we sort of give you a, a, a queuing theory model that you can use, um, sometimes in the old days I used to derive this in class, but I think uh, this is good enough for you to use. I want to make sure that we all have uh, some common words about um, probability. So if we have a distribution of service times, what we see is we have some graph with an average in the middle that says this is the average time it takes for uh, either something to arrive or for the next thing to arrive or for the next thing to be serviced. And um, the mean time is the average, okay, which is the sum of all the probabilities of a given time times time, okay, so that's the average time. There's something called the standard deviation, okay, which is the square root of the variance. And that uh, is basically something about uh, how much of a bell-shaped curve this is or how many standard deviations it's uh, got is uh, something you're also used to from um, thinking about test scores, for instance. <laughs> but uh, the last thing, which is interesting and probably not something that you're so familiar with, is called the uh, squared coefficient of variance which is the variance that's uh, standard deviation squared divided by the mean squared. And this is a unitless uh, measure. And what's surprising about this is this unitless measure is often enough to tell you something about this distribution without having to know anything else about it. You don't have to know its shape. You don't even have to know the mean 
or the variance, all you may need to know is this C, unitless C, and it turns out a memoryless distribution has C equal to one, okay? Um, and no variance <laughs> or deterministic where basically it's always the mean is a, variant, is a C of zero. And you can see why that is. If, if everything always came at exactly the same time, then uh, this uh, sigma is gonna be zero, okay? And so sigma equal to zero means that C is zero. Uh, exponential is one. Okay, and this is where past tells nothing about the uh, future. It's a Poisson process. Many complex systems, as I've mentioned, kind of converge to that. Um, and then disk response time, surprisingly, tend to be with C a, B, uh, a little bit bigger than one. So this is uh, where the majority of the seeks are somewhat less than the average. And uh, this is uh, oftentimes has to do with the way that the file systems are put together. So why am I going to all this uh, trouble with you guys? I wanna tell you why. Um, first of all, you need to uh, have an idea for the input and the output distributions when you're trying to analyze something like a file system. You need to know, for instance, what the, the average time uh, between arrivals of requests, the, ver the standard deviation of that arrivals, and C. And if you have uh, enough of these variables, then you can come up with a queuing model and that queuing model can let, help you predict where you are on that curve in terms of uh, the, uh, the queuing delay. So um, what about this queuing time? Okay, so let's oh, apply. So, Just a very quick question about the pre-flight. Okay. Uh, the, so the 1.5C for the, um, for the uh, uh, actual server this response times, that's from, that's from data collected like in the real world? Yep, this is, uh, this is a number that has shown up with a lot of real world data, that's correct. And then okay. is, there any kind of, is there any kind of mathematical distribution that matches that? Uh, well, it's, yes, any, anything for which the uh, um, sigma squared over mean squared is equal to 1.5. <laughs> so there's actually a whole bunch of them that match that. Oh, it's like a whole family of shapes. Yep. Okay. Great. And actually, let's, uh, let's first um, try to type in some questions, although that one made sense to ask uh, verbally. Uh, all right. Good. Now, yeah, so that's, but uh, following up to that question, notice that C equal to one, there's a whole family of things for which C equal to one. Memoryless is only one of them. There are others like that. But it is interesting that, memoryless distributions have C equal to one. So if it's memoryless, you know C equals one. All right, good. So uh, what about the queuing time? So we've been talking about a queue with a controller and a disk. So in order to really talk about this, we need to look at the system as a whole. So we draw a box around this system and we look at arrivals coming into the queuing system and departures. And queuing th theory uh, of the type that we're gonna talk about in this class is really a long-term steady state behavior in which the arrival rate and the departure rate are equal to each other on average. Why is that? Well, if the arrival rate and departure rate on average weren't equal, then the queuing system is not in a stable state and the queue is either growing without bound or shrinking without bound down to zero, whatever. And we don't really have a, uh, a stable situation. Now it's true that there are lots of transient problems that are interesting where you sort of ask what happens before we get into stable state. Uh, that's a whole nother class that you can take on queuing theory, which we're not going to do in this class. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the steady state behavior. So arrivals are characterized by some probability distribution. Departures are characterized by some probability distribution. And if we put them together, we can sort of ask ourselves how much time is spent in the queue between when an arrival hits the beginning of the queue and when it finally exits, okay? And that's kind of our goal, because our goal, we've already figured out kind of how to deal with a disk and a controller in terms of latency, but this queue is kind of a, is a, is a weird black box for us, and it'd be nice if we had some way to at least estimate what the queuing delay would be. All right, and to do that, we're gonna talk about Little's Law, and I'm gonna, do a lot more about this uh, after I talk about administrivia. But for now, Little's Law, where there's arrivals and departures going through uh, 
a system in steady state looks, uh, basically says the following. So we assume that the arrivals are coming in at a rate of lambda. Okay, that's our arrival rate. We assume that there's some average latency for getting through the system. And what Little's law says, and Little's law is an incredibly general, stable law, no matter what the probability distributions are coming in or leaving, says that the average arrival rate equals the average departure rate implies basically that the number of jobs that are queued in the system here as a whole is equal to lambda times L. Now, let me give you my McDonald's in intuition. So this is the McDonald's intuition of Little's Law. Imagine that you've got a long line going up to the counter of McDonald's and uh, it's stable system. So on average, the line is always the same length on average. And what you see there is that if you enter the door and you look at the number of jobs in front of you, that's the number of people in line, and people are arriving at a certain rate, then what you can say is you look at the number of people in front of you in line, and then when you finally get to the counter and you turn around and you look at the back, you're gonna see there's as many people in line as there were when you entered. And what does that mean? That means that if you take the amount of time you spent in line, that's L, times the rate at which people were arriving while you're in line, and you turn around and you can see that that ought to be this number of people in line. And so that's really what this is all about. This says the average number of people in line at McDonald's is equal to the rate at which they're arriving at the door times how long it takes for you to get to the counter. And um, it's an amazingly useful law and you kind of run into this anytime there's a probabilistic system. Um, and regardless of the structure, burstiness, variations in service, et cetera, whatever, as long as this is a stable state um, and arrivals overall match departures, then Little's Law applies. Okay, and this, so this is a very useful, useful law to remember. Okay, any questions? I'm gonna show you a little proof uh, that's easy, oops, in a moment as to how this works, but okay. Now, um, as a very simple example, by the way, is if it always takes exactly five units of time to, uh, to basically serve you or that you wait for, um, for five units of time in line and people are arriving at one uh, every unit, then what you see is, here is, here's you, you walked in the door, you got here at time zero and five uh, units later, you got to the counter. The next person came in at time one, they get out at six, time two, they get out at seven. So each one of these are people in line. And if you slice over at any point in time and you look how many people are in line, what you see here, for instance, is it's always five. Okay, and so that's in essence, the simple uh, way of thinking of Little's Law when these numbers are not probabilistic, but deterministic. So the, the um, response can be thought of, that's a good question, isn't response the time between arrival and completion of the service? So uh, response can be thought of in a lot of different ways and it depends on what you're measuring. So um, you could talk about the time from entering the queue to departing, I think that's what you were talking about, that's the full system service time. You can talk about the time from entering the controller to uh, exiting the disk. That's the disk uh, service time, okay? And so you're, when you're talking about service time, you have to be careful uh, what you add together. And so, for instance, if we were to compute the time you wait in the queue, and we add to that the average time it takes to service one request, you put those together, that ought to equal the total system time, which is the time from when you enter the queue to when you depart. And so the important part uh, about any sort of queuing system is making sure that you keep track of what you're measuring and which part of the system you're measuring. All right, did I answer that question? Hopefully, um, good. All right, so uh, that's lambda times L is number in line. Okay, and so um, let's see, I thought I, I thought I had administrivia before we did their proof sketch. Hold on a sec here. Okay, let me just do administrivia first here. So, oops, I didn't put uh, anything on this. So a rough cut 
at what's going to happen with the midterm next week is the following. So we moved it to next Thursday. Uh, lectures 10 to 17 are what are important here. All right. And uh, so make sure um, that uh, because this is next Thursday and is going to be from uh, 5 to 7 uh, Pacific Daylight Time, make sure you've filled out the conflict form. Um, uh, Alex has posted that. We're going to try to actually do this live. Okay. Um, and so what we're going to do is a basic mechanism, and we're still going to announce more information as we go forward, but we're going to release an answer book so you can print it out on a printer somewhere. Um, and we'll do that early so that um, you can get to your printer or whatever. And then we'll start the exam on time and send exams out to you, send the actual questions out to you. And uh, you're going to write the answers in the, um, in answers into the uh, exam book. And then when you're done, you're going to scan it with your uh, camera, with your phone. Now, there is a question, what if you don't own a uh, printer or have access uh, to one outside campus, um, I think we will, uh, why don't you uh, post on Piazza, we'll try to figure this out. We're hoping to give you the exam book early enough that you could potentially uh, print it uh, somewhere else as well. Um, but uh, let's see if we can figure that out. Um, so we're, I wanted to um, say that we anticipate that people are gonna do well on this exam. So we're clearly in a different mode now with, uh, this class than we were when everybody was co-located at Berkeley. And so uh, among other things, um, we're basically not, we're not gonna be curving the results um, and we are gonna be invoking the honor code uh, that you're not gonna ask others for help. Um, now we're of course going to um, also have uh, scrambled exams so that not every exam is gonna be the same um, but, uh, and we're also not going to curve and we're going to assume that people are going to do well. So, uh, this is, think of this almost, uh, I don't know, more like a quiz where, um, we're going to lower a bit. We haven't figured out exactly how much the, uh, the value of this. And we're hoping that, uh, people just do the work themselves. And we're hoping to lower the advantages of cheating, but also by not curving it, you're less affected by others cheating. So that's our goal. And um, hopefully we'll figure out the final details by next Thursday. Um, and some of the details about people not owning printers, make sure to start uh, a question about that on uh, Piazza and we'll figure out what to do with that, all right? Okay, now, um, I will uh, also say that um, one of the reasons we're going this way is that, uh, the uh, the Berkeley has actually told us we're not allowed to do any uh, proctoring, remote proctoring at all, uh, until they figure out what we're supposed to do about remote proctoring. Um, we may do uh, we may get something by the time for um, for the final. We're not sure, or for midterm three, we're not sure yet. But this is our this is our attempt at uh, experimenting to see how this goes. All right, um, this. Uh, this will be um, basically open book, but it's not open uh, people. So you're not allowed to talk to other people during this, okay? Um, and we'll give more explicit details about this when we go for, forward, okay. Now, um, is it open internet? Uh, we'll assume that um, we haven't answered that yet. I'm gonna say no for starters, but uh, um, we may change that, we'll see, okay. So uh, the other alternative was to not do midterm two at all. Um, think of this as uh, we're, we're trying this out to see how this works and it's a way to get some additional uh, evaluation for people. And keep in mind, by the way, that uh, you know, the default grade in this class now is pass, no pass, and you have to request the grade. Uh, and I know that people in Berkeley would really like, or the uh, Berkeley administration and a number of people in the department would love people to just keep with the pass no pass as a way of reducing the overall stress, but I know that may or may not happen. Um, okay, so I think we'll leave this for now, um, but we're trying to make it as equitable as we can for everybody and we're hoping that uh, people are going to be honorable about this and um, go from there and we'll see how it goes.
and so we're not curving so just so people know all right good all right now um, I think uh, I'll briefly show you this little proof sketch it's cute uh, but this is another way to look at more general uh, Little's theorem and basically uh, if we have an, a length of time that varies so notice that not all these blue stripes are the same um, and we have a number in jo of jobs in the system that varies and we want to come up with an average relationship between the average number of jobs and the average response time and the arrival rate uh, what would we how would we prove anything about that uh, when we have arbitrary distributions and the way we would do that is we say well take a time t um, lay out people as they arrive and this is the length of time person one spends in the system this is the length of time person two spends in the system person three and so on and lay them out like this okay and uh, if we take any slice we're going to see the number of people in the system at any given time and the trick is what's the average number okay and I'm not going to spend a long time on this I just want to give you a rough sketch okay and the way we would do that is we would instead of L we're going to talk about area so this blue area if I imagine that these are all uh, unit one in height then the area is really uh just l times uh l1 times one so we could say that the area of this whole blue thing which is the sum of all the individual areas equals just l1 plus l2 plus l3 because i'm assuming these rectangles have height one okay so this is uh don't think too hard on this because if you're thinking hard then you're thinking too hard about it okay very simple and now uh if I take all that area and I'm interested in a cross section, well, then I just ask myself sort of what is the average area uh, at any given time, okay? And that's pretty simple. It's basically the total area divided by time gives me how much area in a given portion of time, okay? And so S over T is the same as the sum of the L's over T, as I said before, which the sum of the L's over T, I can sort of put an N over, put an N over T and this over N. So all I've done is multiply it and divide by N total number of jobs. And when I'm done with that, what I end up with is that uh, total jobs over T is the average arrival rate. And all the L's over N total is the average uh, time. And if you notice, then that means that the average number of jobs is equal to lambda uh, times L. Okay. And so that's where it comes from. And it's very general. It doesn't matter what the distributions are. It's a sort of a general, very simple system. Okay. Now, uh, here's some uh, results for you. And this is where this becomes useful now. So we assume the system's in equilibrium. There's no limit to the Q for a moment. Okay. So uh, let's imagine we have an infinite size Q, and then we can deal with uh, non-infinite in a moment. The time between successful arrivals is random and memoryless. Uh, and um, what does that mean? That means for the moment that the arrivals is, uh, is a memoryless process that can be defined by lambda. Okay, and so lambda is memoryless, but the server isn't. So just because, you know, disks are not necessarily memoryless. And so the server, which is some combination of the controller and uh, the disk service time, we're gonna say is one over the average service time, but this is not memoryless. This could be an arbitrarily complicated uh, probability distribution, whatever you want, okay? And so it's memoryless coming in, but arbitrary going out, okay? And what do we, um, how do we describe that? Well, lambda is the average number arriving. Uh, the service time is the average time to serve a customer. So in that um, McDonald's example, it would be if you took the time from when you got to the counter to when you had your hamburger and you averaged them all up, that would be M, okay, M1, uh, or the mean, that's T, sir. And C is the squared coefficient of variance, which is uh, uh, sigma squared over M1 squared for the server. And so this C, if this were a disk, we might have said earlier is 1.5. If this were a memoryless process, it would be one and so on. And so these three parameters, lambda uh, for the arrival and then T service and C uh, for the server, basically are enough for us to find something out. For one thing, we could compute mu by just taking one over T sir, that's already there. 
And so now we have lambda and mu, and we talk about the, the utilization, okay, which is lambda over mu, uh, which if you multiply that out, that's also lambda times t sur, okay. And what do we know? We know that u is better be between zero and one. If u is bigger than one, then things are arriving faster than they can be serviced, and this q will grow without bound, and that's bad, okay. Parameters we wish to compute. Uh, the time spent in the queue. How long are we spending time in there? That might be interesting. The length of the queue. How many items are in there on average? Well, it turns out if we know the time in the queue, Little's Law to the, less, to the rescue says that lambda times TQ gives us LQ. So this uh, length is easy to get once I have the time. And so really all we care about is the time. And so here's a couple of results for you. Um, they're fairly easy to derive, and there's some references I'll give you in a moment where you can go see the derivations. But if the server is memoryless uh, service time, where we call a memoryless input, memoryless output 1Q, MM1, then uh, what's interesting is the time spent in the queue is equal to T sur, which is the average service time, times U over 1 minus U. Okay, where the utilization, look at this uh, item here. If u is zero or close to zero, then this thing on the bottom doesn't matter. As u gets closer and closer to one, notice that the denominator gets close to zero and tq goes toward infinity. So if you get utilization close to one, that's bad, right? Um, now in the general version where we have a general probability distribution here or, or an mg1, that's memoryless input general output, it's a little bit uh, complicated, but not too much. So notice T sur is the same and U over one minus U is the same, but one half one plus C is how we account for an arbitrarily complicated distribution in the server. All right, now come back for a moment from your shock at a bunch of equations on a uh, 162 slide for a moment and look at the difference between MM1 and MG1 Notice the very slight difference here is just this little uh, fra uh, factor here of one half one plus C. And that C is a number and it's all that's needed no matter how complicated the probability of service is. That's rather remarkable, I think, okay? That just having C here is enough to uh, describe, actually C and the average service time is enough to describe this regardless of how complicated the uh, service time is. Okay, and by the way, if you plug one in for C for memory list, then one plus one is two, divided by two is one. And so when you put C equal to one, it degenerates down into that, okay. The other thing to notice is this factor, as I mentioned here, U over one minus U is exactly this guy, okay? It's the fact that, um, now these equations aren't talking for, talking about the uh, overhead piece, which is, which is independent of the Q. It's talking about this piece, and that, uh, that growth goes up toward infinity as you get to 100%, okay? So the utilization gets higher and higher and we get close to using the disk at its full speed. Uh, we get closer and closer to an infinite response time and that actually will transfer into, uh, the reason this is going toward infinity is literally because the queue is getting infinitely long. All right. So again, that's why you don't want to be close to 100%. Now, of course, uh, can anybody tell me why in real life, obviously there won't be an infinite response time? Yep, finite Q, good answer. Okay, yeah, there's a Q that's finite, which means that at some point what happens is the Q stops allowing things to come in. And so uh, you end up basically saturating your ability to put into the queue, which means that whoever is putting requests in is uh, backed up with flow control in some sense, and you can't put any more items in, okay? And so there, at some point when the queue fills up, uh, that's gonna limit your arrival rate. But assuming you put a big enough queue in here so that the queue is not your, normally your uh, limit, then it's still the case that if you arrive too rapidly, you'll get a uh, very high response time here. Okay, now I'm gonna stop for a second and ask if anybody has any questions here. And while you're thinking of your question, notice 
What I've got here in red, lambda, t, sur, and c, these are the only independent things you need to figure out how to derive in order to handle a q, queuing situation of an mg1q. Okay, it's just those three items because everything else here is derived. Uh, mu is derived, u is derived, tq is derived, l is lq is uh, derived. They're all derived once you know those three items. Uh, and so if we were applying this to a real scenario, we would first try to come up with these values, okay? All right, should I move on? All right, let's see how we might do this, all right, uh, in a moment. But I wanna um, ask another, put, give you another very simple little simulation in some sense of why you get an unbounded bounded response time. So if we arrive, uh, if items are arriving deterministically, it's possible to sustain utilization equal to exactly one in this unrealistic situation where things are arriving uh, deterministically one after another and they take, there's no burstiness and they take exactly the same amount of time to arrive. We can in principle at least, it to be serviced, I mean, we can in principle at least uh, line them up end to end and get 100% utilization of the disk. Okay. But, any, the moment we have any randomness at all or burstiness, it's no longer po possible. And that's when we start getting this interesting behavior. And why is that? Well, because here's a burst. Notice we had arrive, 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 and then they get serviced. And then because of the burstiness, there are long tails. So then there are periods of time that um, you don't have arrivals. And then we have the next set gets serviced and so on. And that, um, burstiness means that we have these gaps and these gaps never uh you never make up for the gaps okay and so that's why you can't get utilization equal to one when you have any burstiness on the input because you have these gaps preventing it okay okay and that waste of uh the wasted time here is never reclaimable because there's nothing to service here we're actually idle the disk is is not doing anything during this gap when you have burstiness and by sort of setup when i set up these equations for you, we're assuming this arrival rate is a memoryless arrival rate, which is by definition bursty because it's got a Poisson distribution to it. Okay, and real life is uh, probabilistic and bursty. Okay. The last thing I wanna do uh, before we leave the queuing theory here for you is let's give an example. So suppose a user requests 10 8K blocks per second, Suppose that the requests and service time are exponentially distributed for a moment. So we're gonna say C equals one on input and output. The average service is 20 milliseconds. So that's, we'll assume is the controller plus the seek plus rotation plus translation, uh, plus um, pulling the, the time to take things off of the disk um, and uh, transaction service time. And what you see here is how utilized is the disk? Well, from the previous slide, we see that uh, utilization equal lambda times service time. Uh, so the answer is uh, lambda times service time, you could compute that. What's the average time spent in the queue? Time in the queue. What's the average number of requests in the queue? LQ, okay? What's the average response time for a disk request? There was a question earlier about what's the total time that a user sees, and it's basically TQ plus TSIR. Okay, and so as a result, we can just compute these. So if lambda is the average number of arriving customers per second, that's 10 per second. Okay. Uh, the average time to service an 8K disk block, I've said by my spec here is 20 milliseconds. Now, if you were given this problem in an exam or something, what you would really have to do is compute this 20 milliseconds by doing something having to do with the size of the block you're reading off of the disk, the uh, transfer time, uh, the seek plus rotation time averages and so on controller time and you'd compute this 20 milliseconds based on eight kilobytes and other stats that we've given you but for now i've told you it's 20 and so since t sir is 20 which is 0.02 seconds uh, i can say my utilization is 0.2 so this uh, disk is uh, 20 percent utilized okay and uh, what's the time in the queue well this is the average time for customers in the queue is well, it's an MM1Q because I've got C equals one for the output. And so it's basically T sir times U over one minus U. I can do that calculation and I find that I'm spending five milliseconds in the queue. Uh, 
okay? The length of the queue I get from little flaw is lambda times TQ, so that's 10 seconds, uh, or 10 per second times 0 0.005 seconds. And so the length of the queue is 0 0.05 items on average in the queue. So this queue is not heavily loaded, all right? If, and if you notice, kind of I'm, my utilization here is, uh, is low, okay? It's, it's kind of, um, it's not too bad, it's, it's a 20%. If I were to increase the number of user requests per second, and I were to get this to go up closer to five, uh, you know, 50% or higher, then this would start growing and I'd start seeing on average multiple items in the queue. And so by the way, just the final T system, careful to always remember to calculate is that time in the queue plus the time, one more time to be serviced by the disk, because once I get out of the queue, I get serviced. And so that's the uh, five milliseconds here of time in the queue, 20 milliseconds to be serviced. And so it's a, on average a 25 milliseconds service, which is a little longer than the average service time of 20 milliseconds. Okay. So the queue is starting to have an effect, but not a lot. And again, if I were to up my user request enough, that time, time would get much more than 20. Good. All right, are we good? All right, oops, I missed my little um, time to take a break. You guys good with just continuing for a little bit until the end of the class? Right, let's, uh, let's do that, because there are some other things I'd like to, to go here. So um, by the way, there's some good queuing theory resources um, on, the, on the homepage. Uh, if you go to the resources, there's a Patterson, some stuff from a, one of the Patterson books that sort of explains where uh, some of those numbers and uh, the formulas come from. There's also a website that's got all sorts of resources on queuing. Um, and there's a bunch of previous mid, uh, midterms with queuing theory questions that you can look at. And uh, you might assume that queuing theory is fair midterm, fair uh, game for midterm three, um, not for midterm two, because we're we're beyond the material for that. Okay, and I think they might actually talk about queuing theory uh, in tomorrow's section. So, all right, now um, let's talk briefly about optimizing I/O performance. So, how do you improve performance? Make everything faster. All right, can't always do that. So, um, maybe you make things more decoupled. So by putting multiple disks and queues in, you can make things faster. Okay, and so um, I, somebody mentioned last time RAID 0 striping. Part of the way that uh, what RAID 0 really does to make things faster is it ups the, uh, the bandwidth to the disks, thereby reducing the overall uh, transfer time and therefore making uh, things faster. Okay. You could have uh, optimizing the bottleneck somehow, okay? Um, you could fi fix the software paths to make the queuing faster. You could do other useful work while waiting. Well, we talked about that when we talked about scheduling and page faults. So when you got a page fault, go do something else, okay? Um, but queues are incredibly useful to absorb bursts and prevent, for instance, the user threads from being blocked by being unable to queue things, okay? So queues, even though they can cause this behavior, are actually really good things in general. It's just if you try to overload the devices that you get into this bad part of the queue. Okay. And uh, if you have finite queues and you can deal with blocking a little bit, then by pushing some of the uh, pushing some of the generation back on the threads so they don't generate quite as many, that is a way to improve performance for other people by slowing down the generators of requests. So now we could talk about scheduling I.O. What happens when two processes are accessing storage in different regions of the disk? What can the driver do? Uh, how can buffering help? What about non-blocking I.O. or threads with blocking I.O. or what limits how much reordering the OS can do? We can start talking about scheduling of the actual disk operations. And a lot of this is gonna have to do with the file system, okay? So when is disk performance highest? Well, when they're big sequential reads or when there's so much work to do that you can rearrange all the work and arrange to have as little seek as possible, okay? And I'm gonna show you that in a moment of reordering the queues. So either big sequential reads or a lot of independent reads that can be reordered. And it's okay to be inefficient when things are mostly idle. 
So we don't really care if we're inefficient under normal circumstances until there's so many things that are trying to get a resource, it's overloaded, and then we have to be efficient. So bursts now are both a threat and an opportunity. They're a threat because as you see, they can put you into that regime of queuing where things get really slow. They're an opportunity because when you have a bunch of items that all arrive at the queue at once, then you have a bunch of items in the queue that can be rearranged to better use the disk. Okay. And uh, there are lots of ways to do optimization. And uh, my hope is by the end of this class, you'll have a lot of good thoughts about how to optimize things because you will be master system programmers and uh, system designers by the end. Um, we can use, uh, there are lots of other techniques which we're not going to go into day, today by user level drivers and um, doing other useful work in the user level and so on. That's, uh, that's for a different day to talk about it. But let's, uh, let's specifically look at disk scheduling. So disks can only do one request at a time. So what order do you do your requests in? Um, so if user requests come in, this is saying uh, sort of what track and what sector, for instance, then um, you know, it might be uh, track two, sector two, track five, sector two, track seven, sector two, so on and so forth. Um, or these could be cylinders as opposed to tracks. And as you can imagine, if they, things come in and they're uh, a bunch of random tracks or cylinders, the head is going to be moving a lot if you're forced to do things in FIFO order. So FIFO order is bad, right? We learned that uh, a while back when we were dealing with um, paging. It's bad here as well because uh, it's forcing the disk to move in the same way that the requests um, have come in, rather than taking a group of requests and reordering them. So say the head only moves a small amount and continuously in or out, that would be a much better scheduling, but it's not gonna be FIFO, okay? So for instance, we could imagine this kind of scheduling, shortest uh, seek time first. Okay, so you pick the request, you got a bunch of items in a queue, you pick the one that's closest to where you currently are, and you go and service that request, and so on. And then you take the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Um, and you're always going toward the closest one physically on the disk. Okay, so this is uh, probably, you could imagine this is the best way to reduce seek time, because we're only moving as little as we can by reordering the queue. The downside is you might lead to starvation, because if user requests keep coming in, to a particular part of the disk like the middle, then you might never handle things on the outside. And so starvation could be a problem with this, okay? Um, we could also do something called scan, which is element, uh, basically an elevator algorithm that takes the closest request in the direction of travel. So we travel in and then out and then in. This is just like an elevator which picks you up on the way. And so what we do is as we're scanning in and out, we find the items that are on the track we're on or the cylinder that we're on rather than the next one on the queue, okay? It's called scan. This doesn't have starvation, but it does kind of have that idea of, S of uh, SSTF because we're only picking up folks and moving as minimally as we can back and forth. Um, now the downside is uh, that this can actually lead to a little bit of disadvantage to folks on the ends because we kind of meet in the middle multiple times and the ones toward the ends don't get serviced as frequently. Um, so there is a version called circular scan where you go uh, all the way out and pick people up and then you quickly scan back and you go all the way out again. So it'd be like an elevator that uh, was local on the way up but then did a, an express down to the bottom and then came back up again. It's a little bit more fair, okay? Um, not biased toward pages in the middle, but on the other hand, um, you may or may not care quite that much about service time. And so this, the uh, elevator algorithm is a pretty common option. All right. So, all right, questions. Now I'll point out that at the beginning of time, so to speak, uh, these algorithms such as scan were actually in the elevator algorithm were actually implemented in the operating system because the operating system knew 
when it moved the head, it was moving it to a particular cylinder uh, track and sector. Now, a lot of that is hidden and the controller does the elevator algorithm, but operating systems in some cases still try to do the elevator algorithm. And so you often have two uh, competing um, doers of the elevator algorithm. And so that's not always a good thing, okay? The controllers are very fast. Um, so this was a question about uh, optimizing disk scheduling. Here's a question about how we hide IO latency. And uh, if you remember, and this is a recall, we talked about the blocking interfaces are when uh, a task goes to do a read, it gets put to sleep until the data is ready. Or when you write, you get put to sleep until the data can be put in queues going out uh, to the interface. That's a blocking interface and is usually the default on most, uh, on most, process, or, um, excuse me, most file systems have that as a default. But with the IOCTL control, you can often put things in a non-blocking interface, which is just give me what you got and tell me how much you uh, pulled in or sent out, non-blocking, or asynchronous, which is uh, go ahead and send me a signal later when I'm completed, okay? And both of those are options that you can often uh, apply to uh, a particular socket or a file descriptor once they've been opened. So now let's move a little bit forward, okay? So going from the top down, we've been talking bottom up for, uh, for most of the last couple of lectures, but from the top down now, if you remember the IO and APIs and system calls basically have variable size buffers at user level, which uh, work on um, memory and use memory addresses to address things in the buffer. And once we uh, get into the file system, we move to the block level. So even though at the uh, POSIX uh, syscall level, we get to think about bytes and uh, reading and writing bytes of arbitrary uh, numbers and uh, reading and writing variable size structures, once we get into the file system, we don't have that as an option. So typical file systems are divided up into four kilobyte blocks, okay? And so those blocks are then stored on the disk itself, and we have physical indexing onto the disk. So at the file system level, we have logical indexing of which block uh, offset are we at. So the first 4K bytes are block zero, the next 4K bytes are block one and so on in the file. But once we get to the disk, now we've got sectors, which might be 512 bytes or four kilobytes. And somehow the file system has to talk about which sectors are in the file and in which order on a hard disk. In the case of an SSD, there's a similar idea, but now the block numbers go through a translation later to talk about which physical blocks are of interest. And one of the ways of knowing why there's a translation layer there, as I mentioned, I uh, mentioned where leveling earlier, where the controller inside the SSD is busy changing which blocks are physically where in order to uh, make sure that things don't wear out. And uh, so there's a translation layer which points at the physical blocks and uh, and then typically there are a bunch of erased pages that are on a linked list handled by the controller. So we got to figure out how to go from this uh, arbitrarily um, no boundary kind of byte oriented view to blocks that are in a file system and maybe randomly arranged on the device themselves. And that's our goal of the file system. And so really we're kind of getting our way past the syscall layer down into the file system itself, all right? And if you remember, for instance, we have things like open, create, and close, which uh, open uh, our files based on a file name, provide some flags and some permission bits, and return a file descriptor. And so now the trick is, how do we even build something like this? So we've got a file name, which only really means something relative to the file system. And what comes back is something that then we can apply these, read, write, seek, F sync, sync, so on, operations to it. Okay, so those are, this is where we're at now. We gotta figure out how to actually do this. Okay, and when write returns data is on its way to disk and can be read but may not actually be permanent, that's an interesting problem which we're gonna talk about as well because when we write arbitrary bytes, we may not be able to uh, push them immediately out to disk if we're trying to buffer things. And therefore, it's possible that we've returned to the user saying the write was completed, but it's still in buffer storage. We'll have to talk about that as well. So how do we build a file system? Well, first of all, what's a file system? So a file system 
layers of the operating system that transform the block interface of the disks, which are, um, you know, here's some blocks on some track and sector and so on into files and directories, which are really what you as a programmer want to use. And the components of these are many fold. So first of all, there's naming, which is turning uh, those names, those file names uh, into something that is understandable at the lower level for the physical blocks stored on disk. We have to figure out how to manage those blocks. So we collect disk blocks into files, uh, collect free lists, et cetera, uh, and uh, know which blocks we can reuse. We need protection to protect uh, layers of data um, from different users. We need reliability and durability questions. How do we keep parts of the file durable despite things crashing, all right, media failures, attacks, et cetera? Um, and the user's view is uh, as follows. Let me give you another example of how this goes. So the system's view, uh, the user's view is durable data structures of arbitrary size, I said that earlier. The system's view is a collection of bytes uh, at the system, before the system call level and uh, doesn't matter to the system what you're storing there. So if you remember those bytes are, uh, the, the operating system doesn't care whether you're storing a database with fixed records or you're storing a bunch of individual text uh, lines in some document and so on. So the system's view is that the system called interface level is again this uh, collection of bytes. Uh, inside the operating system, it's a collection of blocks. Okay, and those blocks are sort of the basic unit for talking to the disk. And as I've mentioned uh, in a couple previous lectures, the block size, say 4K, is t often bigger than the sector size on disk, which is the minimum uh, unit that you can read and write from that disk. And so we could look at it this way. We got the user has a file, which goes to the file system, which goes to the disk. And if the user says, give me bytes two through 12 of the file, what actually has to happen? Well, we have to fetch a block from the file system that has those bytes, pull it into the file system, and then return blocks uh, bytes two through 12 to the user. Okay, so that says there's some interesting buffering going on here because probably we're pulling a block off the disk, putting it in the file system cache, and then extracting a few bytes and returning from the system call to the user. Um, and even more so, what if the user wants to write bytes two through 12? Well, that's, uh, even more tricky because we uh, certainly can't write a few bytes onto the disk. So what happens there is we fetch the block, we merge in the ones the user wanted to write, and sometime later, maybe not immediately, we write that back out to disk. Okay, so everything inside the file system is going to be in terms of whole size blocks. The actual disk I.O. happens inside in terms of blocks. And um, any reads or writes that are smaller than the block size at the user's uh, level have to be translated uh, between the user and the file system into blocks. And that's gonna be part of uh, um, matching up there that we have to handle, okay? So what are some basic entities on disk? Of obviously files, which are usable, usable, uh, visible user, visible groups of blocks, sorry about that, arranged sequentially in logical space, and directories, which are indexes mapping names to files. And we're gonna to need to figure out how to uh, produce files and how to produce directories. What's interesting about that and fortunate is that directories are basically just files uh, with names to file mappings. And so assuming we can figure out how to make a file work, then typically making a directory work is much easier after that. Um, we're gonna access the disk itself as sort of a linear array of sectors. Um, in the old days, we used to identify uh, sectors as by their cylinder, surface, and sector, okay? And the operating system actually had to track that. Um, and uh, I'll hold off on that question. I'll answer it in a moment. Now, however, the, uh, the operating system doesn't know exactly what cylinder, surface, sector a given block is on. Instead, it's got a logical block addressing scheme that starts from zero and goes up to the maximum block and the controller of the disk translates that into cylinder surface and sector. And what the operating system really has going for it is it knows that if it has two blocks whose logical addresses are roughly close to each other, they're gonna be roughly close to each other on the disk. And that's pretty much all the information that the uh, operating system has other than maybe some information about uh, you know, how many blocks might fit on a cylinder, et cetera. Okay. 
the controller does the translation from address to physical position. And uh, these days, it's really the hardware is pretty much shielding the OS from the structures on the disk. Now, there's an interesting question on the uh, chat a second ago, which was, does LSeq actually cause the head to seek? No. Um, LSeq really causes the pointer in the user's uh, proc structure um, to uh, go uh, to move, okay? And so when you open a file, there is a current pointer of where you are in the file, and all that LSeq does is changes that pointer to where you want to be in the file, and then when you do a read or write, that translates into give me bytes at a different place. And so LSeq is really only seeking in the file structure, not anything to do with seeking on disk. So it's, it's, a, it's a seek within the file, not within the physical media. All right, and so I wouldn't even call it a vestigial part of the, the uh, API. It's, it's a part of the byte uh, side of the API, not the disk side of the API. Okay, so what does the file system need? It needs how to track free disk blocks. Need to know where to put newly written data. Has to figure out how to track which blocks contain data for which files you need to know where to read a file from. It needs to figure out how to track files in a directory. So you have to find a list of the files blocks given its name. And where do we maintain all of this information? <laughs> okay, so which disk blocks are free, which blocks contain data for which files, where, which are directories. Where do we maintain all of this? Well, we might cache it in memory while the system is running, but by and large, we have to push all that stuff out to disk, okay? So basically all that information somewhere on disk, all right? And so next time we're gonna pick this up, but um, data structures on disk are um, different from data structures in memory for a number of reasons, not the least of which they can't be arbitrary size. They, you're forced to deal with blocks at a time um, and you have to pull in whole blocks and push out blocks even when you're writing something smaller. And you also have to worry about durability. So the file system, um, is somehow keeping meaningful state even on shutdown and even if you crash in the middle you have to worry about that and so this is also something we're going to talk about as we go forward okay and so what are some critical factors of the file system I'm going to finish up in a sec uh, durable data store it's all on disk we figured that out we have to figure out how to get performance maximizing sequential access and minimizing seek that's going to be challenging uh, we have to figure out how to um, deal with protection checks, all right? Well, fortunately, the POSIX interface says we open first and do reads or writes second. So our, we can do all of our protection checks on the open side of the file system, not on the reading and writing side. Um, the size of a file is completely unknown until you finish writing to it. So this is a funny problem that you will not have appreciated, I bet, until we look at file systems. You open a file and you start writing uh, to that file and then you close it. The file system doesn't know if you're about to write five bytes and close the file or a terabyte and close the file. And so we actually have to determine size as we go and that means we're gonna have to figure out how to optimize our placement on the disk on the go, all right? And so that's actually like a side effect of the POSIX interface. We're gonna to have to figure out how to organize into directories. You know, what data structure is on disk for that? And we need to allocate in free disk uh, blocks. So what we're gonna do next time is we're gonna actually look at a number of different file systems. I thought I might get to the FAT file system today. That's okay, we're not. We'll do that on Tuesday. But um, in conclusion, uh, we uh, talked a lot about queuing theory today. We noticed that bursts and high utilization give you queuing delays. And this, uh, these queuing delays are fundamentally a part of the, the probability and the burstiness on the input side. Okay, we gave you a couple of useful equations for MM1 and MG1 queues, which are the simplest to analyze. So that's memoryless on the input, but arbitrary on the output. And it's just an equation like this. So if you can come up with T sur, C, and, uh, and the utilization, so you can come up, which can be derived in multiple ways, you can come up with a queuing delay. Okay, we started talking about how the file system transforms blocks into files and directories and how to optimize uh, for access and usage patterns. And we're talking clearly are gonna need to figure out how to maximize sequential access and allow efficient random access at the same time 
that's going to be part of our file system design. And so that's going to get pretty interesting as we move forward. And as you can imagine, uh, the, uh, the optimization is a little different for an SSD. And we'll talk a little bit about that because we don't have to worry as about seeking, but we may have to worry about writing uh, too many things, okay, because we don't want to wear it out. Um, and next time we'll actually start talking about uh, how we structure things and what the header is called an inode, which is going to be our entry point into building a file system. All right, everybody, have a great day um, and the uh, rest of your day, I mean, and we will see you on Tuesday and watch for a lot more information about upcoming midterm on Piazza. Um, all right, talk to you later. Bye now.